fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, back in the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm Al Warren. Cop on duty is Kevin Thompson. Hey! Over here, over here, keeping everybody safe. Yeah, well, it's a it's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. Um, <laughs> so, okay, now uh, we've been getting comments. Of course, I have to I have to say that um, uh, some of the comments are really nice, and we appreciate the uh, good comments. And we'd really prefer that you just didn't listen and not give us bad comments. And, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, of, well, of course. I like uh, critical. I, I like people to say good things or bad things, but, you know. As long as it's constructive, as long as it helps us make the show better. That's right. Um, so uh, we were reading that other one, the um, one about you guys are interesting, but you need to consider that the earth is flat. <laughs> um. Is that established science? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there we go. Um, we're really sorry. We didn't, uh, it, he says we need to do more research. So, we're, just, yeah, because we're, the Mars landings are fake, the moon landings are fake, and there is no space. You guys need to do some more research. Okay, we apologize, and we will do some more research on that and as soon as we find the evidence that the world is flat and we live under a dome we will have whoever tells us that's true <laughs> and well uh, allow me to amend that al we actually have done the research we have had mark Sargent, who is one of the experts on the flat earth theory yeah we've had him on on your show and we've actually had him on z talk radio and he's presented a very compelling case. However, it's not convincing enough. So we have done the research, and I shall proceed forward with my spherical Earth theory. So there you go. You're part of the problem. <laughs> so now, and, and we continue. Um, uh, what can I say? So remember, everybody, we've got some good shows coming up here. Um, of course, we're doing the Courtney Love and um, some shows around her as well, and the killing of, or the death of Kurt Cobain. And we also have um, booked uh, F. Lee Bailey. Oh, that's going to be exciting. That's coming up soon. Yeah, actually, we record with him next week. And the chief of police for the Seattle Police Department. So um, some uh, interesting shows. Um, coming up, um, you know, I, I, I actually, and the p police chief sounds really nice. I've only talked to him on the phone and, and all that, but I'm going to meet him early before the show and uh, go over some things. So that's really interesting. Um, he's uh, uh, quite a quite a nice guy from the sounds of it. It's, uh, um, I guess I don't know why he sounds surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now our our our. I'm kind of proud because our guest today, I actually have a bond with already. And both of us are from Alabama. Oh, should I cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no editing here. <laughs> no teleprompter. We're teleprompter free. Yeah, this is the uh, teleprompter free zone and the Trump free zone. Remember that? Okay. We're not going there. Okay, so now, t yeah, so we're we're talking about um, uh, an ex-cop, I believe he was, uh, and uh, he's written some interesting books here, and it's uh, really caught my eye. So uh, he's agreed to be on the show, and we're pleased that he's here. Here, 
Stephen <laughs> David Lampley, thank you for joining us. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me. So, so Stephen, um, now that you're on board in the crazy house of mystery, um, let's start with um, who you were. Like, where where were you a policeman, and and sort of uh, what was that career about for you? How long did it last, and uh, when did you leave? Uh, actually, I, I got bored. I was a banker prior to being a police officer, and got bored sitting behind the desk, and gave up my my career there, and my secretary went to work at. Uh, Birmingham Police Department in Alabama. That's where I started. Uh, and then I worked for a couple of other departments after that, where I, after 21 years, I retired. I uh, spent the last four, little under four years working undercover uh, SVU with child predators online. Oh, oh, wow. You've had a rough career. First Birmingham and then working with child, you know, ch child crimes. Yeah, it was it was interesting. It uh, I never really had a clue. The, the chief came to uh, called me one day. And said, I need to see you in the office. Of course, I immediately thinking, okay, what did I do? You know, what have I done? Uh, am I getting days off? <laughs> Police don't call. He don't call you in the office for usually for good stuff. So I'm immediately True. thinking back of all the stuff I might have done. Like, I really couldn't think of anything. So I go in the police department. He said, I'm going to see you in my office. So I was just going downhill real quick, you know. <laughs> so we go in the office. He said, sit down, close the door. Oh, it's really getting bad. You know, my career's done, blah, blah, blah. And then he proceeds to tell me, he said, I don't want you single-handedly. I don't want anybody else to know about it. Only you and I, the mayor, city council, no one else is to know. I want you to form an undercover investigative unit. The other, the other detectives aren't to know. And I want you to go after child predators. I said, wow, you know, I know nothing. But he said, well, you learn and you learn quick. Whatever you need, I'll give you uh, equipment, whatever. So anyway, that, that was the beginning of that. And we, in the, our first 90 days, we had made cases on 87 fella. Holy crap. So, yep. You know, people really don't have a clue, the general population really doesn't have a clue what's going on. You know, there are so many, it's so prevalent that I, I, I was clueless. I was really clueless. Yeah, well, but, you know, i gotta, I got to jump in for a sec because I, I've had, uh, you guys probably all know Chris Hansen, you know, because he's on yes. Crime Watch. But before he was on Dateline, he was doing all those uh, predators. To catch a predator. And he's doing it again, and I was talking to him, and he had a really interesting point to me that you're saying it's really pre prevalent and it really is there's you know like you said 80 some cases and so on but what do you attribute that to because like he was saying that this seems to be a normal process like it's endless it seems to be I'm not saying normal behavior but it, it seems to be so many of them going on how can how can how can we fix that and and what do you attribute it to? Because we can't, I mean, we couldn't just, just arrest everybody, or I guess we could, but there's so many child predators. Like, what's what's wrong with society? I, you know, I, I wish I knew. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, you know, it, it is so, I, I, there were times that I would sit behind my computer and I would just shake my head, you know. I, it just, it's, it's, it's amazing, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, that, that is, it is so many. And, and as we went on, not only I found myself being led, uh, we started out with child predators, and we arrested, you know, we, we made some arrests on those. Uh, but then I found out after a few weeks that I was getting requests from adults, mainly males, uh, me as a 14-year-old girl, that's who, it, that's who they thought I was, asking me to, to take new photos of myself. Well, that's the attempted production of child pornography there. So I found myself being led into child pornography and child pornographers. And then, of course, you know, that in, that involved the feds. So I, I met with the assistant DA. I said, look, this is, this is where this is going after it became known what we were doing, this is where this is going, and I, I'm going to need, do you know anybody in the FBI or, you know, anybody like that? 
and she connected, she connected me with the United States Postal Inspector, who in turn connected me with the FBI, and then in turn contacted me. But we got up with the Department of Justice, United States Attorney's Office, and we started working child porn cases. Uh, and then that led into me being contacted by individuals who wanted to buy and sell children. So it snowballed into something I really had no clue about. <laughs> really had no clue was going to happen. You know? Holy crap. But it is. It's so prevalent. And I don't know if there's an answer because most psychologists and psychiatrists, of course, there's varied opinions, but most would say it's not a, uh, you can't be rehabilitated. Part of what I'm thinking, I'm thinking, we well, see, because uh, first of all, we look at things subjectively. So personally, I don't get it. Like, I'm, I'm not interested in children, never have been, except for when I mm -hmm. was a child, I guess. But I, I, so I don't really get it that way subjectively. And objectively, again, it's really confusing because I, uh, I don't understand, but I can see um, some creeps out there yeah. buying and selling kids, you know, and and all that but when they do these shows and they do these setups it's like you said there's there's just tons and tons of men trying to get 14 year olds and 12 year olds and all this i i just don't understand it and i don't i don't see where we can go with it that's all so well maybe al it's maybe it's an ego trip that i'm the first one to actually perform this act on this person and there's also a lot of insecurity in there as well. A lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, they don't relate to adults, so they relate to children. Yeah, the Michael Jackson sort of syndrome. Yeah. 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 Not, not suggesting that he. <laughs> well, no, not at all. No, no. Just, just, but you know, no. Of, of all reality, he was definitely more secure around children. Whether he had sex with them or not, it's, it's, you know, it's not been proven in court. But he was definitely uh, drinking his Jesus juice and <laughs> and hanging out with little kids in in his bedroom. True. And, uh, we don't, you know, we don't have any legal proof. But well, know. from to hear him tell it, it's the most, you know, natural act that you can do. Well, see, and there we go. I just, I just find it really confusing because I, you know, I could, because at one time before the Chris, Chris Hansen interview, I was thinking that it was just something that happened every once in a while. And it wasn't, you know, you'd catch one or two type creeps that were raping little kids, and that's really bad. But it just seems like uh, it, there's tons of them. They're accelerating because, you know, I, I noticed, I, I work in corrections, um, you know, like I said before, you know, we come on the air, and we are starting to get more and more and more and more of this, and it, you know, what is going on? What is this trend that, that we're in? It's found by the Internet, actually. Yeah, it's, it's given a... And, a yeah. and I would have to agree with that. You know, before the, you know, we're now beyond the age of, hey, I'll send you a couple of Polaroids. Yeah. The Internet has, has, called an, has caused a tremendous surge in child pornography and child solicitation. Tremendous. Now, now here's a very difficult question, because I, you know, before, prior to me moving to Alabama, I served a very short tenure undercover, but all I ever had to do was drive drugs around. Mm -hmm. it, it during your period working with child predators, did you ever find yourself in a position to where you sympathized or began to understand what was going on with them? No, not at all. <laughs> it was never, uh, no, no, not even close. Uh, yeah. And then an adult or anybody that would take advantage of a child is totally, to me, irrehensible. It's, uh, there's, I, there's no justification for that. And, and, I, I could not relate whatsoever. Yeah, and that's the thing. That's, that's where I have the problem because I don't relate. I just don't get it. Uh, and, and that's not, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody, but I just don't relate. I don't, it's just something I, I don't understand. So, Well, I, I you know, and, and I'm going to a step forward with this question. Having said that, 
you know, I, I happen to know from, you know, working in law enforcement for 20 some odd years that pedophiles and child predators, they have a certain code or, you know, they have certain symbols or certain ways of identifying each other. So if you didn't relate to them in some sort of way, how did they come to trust you? Well, we, we started this, uh, I guess, innocently, if that's the word I'm looking for, enough to where I would I would portray myself as a 14-year-old girl. And then, you know, at that time, Yahoo had chat, and I went to a general. I didn't go to a sex room. I didn't go to anything leading. I went to just a general chat room. And I would log on. I wouldn't say anything. And within a span of seconds, I would have adults contacting me, contacting me, contact. Hey, how are you, sweetie? And the grooming process, some of them, some of them didn't try to groom. They just went right on into the sex. Some went wow. to the grooming process. Uh, but, yeah, yeah it's... <laughs> well, you, wow. I've seen your picture, so you don't look like a... <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing that kind of work, doesn't that affect mm -hmm. your own family in a way, in your own family life? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, when I, police officers, as a rule, and, and Kevin can probably relate to this some, stuff you don't take it home. You know, you leave it at work as best you can. You know, it stays in your head. You know, I, and the only real effect it had on my family at the time was the hours that I had to keep because I had to be available. You know, if I had a predator driving from Tennessee or if I had a predator driving from wherever, then I needed to be available at 3 o'clock in the morning when my parents were, quote, unquote, gone for the night. So it, that was the, really only the impact that uh, it had on my family were hours, uh, which I, I didn't tell them most about what I was doing. It really didn't... Uh, wasn't important enough, you know, and they really didn't know the, they need to know the details. So now, um, when you first started writing books, uh, what was your first book, and and how did you uh, uh, get into into writing that subject? Well, I wasn't going to write at all. I had no intentions whatsoever of writing any book, and I had some friends uh, who knew of my police career and said, "Steve, you need to write a book." I said, "No, that's not going to happen." <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> And they just kept on and kept on. I said, look, I'm, let, me, let me make this really clear to you. I am not writing a book, okay? You know? Anyway, they kept on. I said, look, I'll write the damn book. You shut up. You know? <laughs> just, just be quiet. <laughs> so, so, so I wrote Outside Your Door. I said, uh, actually, Troy King, the former Attorney General of the State of Alabama, was uh, nice enough to write the foreword. He and I worked together in some of these job marriage cases. Oh, wow. And uh, he was nice enough to write the foreword. So, uh, once I had the book written, I was in the process of looking for an a, a agent or a publisher that would, that would take it. And I had some uh, author friends online that said, no, 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 you, uh, that, that's, you do not want to do that. You want to self-publish Amazon, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, I'm going to plug anybody, but that's who they said. I thought, you know, I don't know that I want to do that, but uh, they made it sound so so good. So what I decided to do is write a, another book, a shorter book, and run that through the self-publishing uh, program and see how it worked. Well, I was so impressed with the, with the way it worked in the self-publishing that I then decided, yes, I would run my other book through it. So actually, my first book was my second one. And then I thought, you know, this, this is not such a bad deal, right? Writing is actually fun. So then I... Uh, I decided, well, let's do a serial killer book. It came out just effective yesterday, and I have another book uh, coming out September 30th entitled 1003 and One Half, True Crime Facts You May Not Know. Oh. Um, now, so what's your obsession then with this uh, serial killer? Like what, what inside the mind of a serial killer, I think is the subtitle. What was, what was the idea behind that and... Um, how how do you kind of like what are you presenting in that book? It's basically uh, it's, there's no lot of uh, I mean intricate detail in that book, but uh, I, I got the idea because when I was in the military, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and I were friends. He and I would drink beer together, we ate mess all together, and 
uh, yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer and I were friends back in 78 when he was in Fort St. Houston. And, uh, you know, that, I guess, was part of it because Jeffrey, when people ask him what was he like, well, he was like you and me. He was cordial. He was nice. He was friendly, well-spoken, mannerly. And uh, when people think of serial killers, their first comment to me is, well, what's a cute serial killer look like? Well, they look like you and me. Exactly. Some under the bridge ogre with dragging arms on the ground. That's not what a super killer is. Um, and then, of course, with my arrest of the Claremont children when I was with the Birmingham Police Department, he was a very nice, outgoing gentleman as well. Uh, he just, they both have a version of killing and eating people. And, well, he, the, the Claremont killer didn't eat people. But I thought, you know, that, that's really something maybe people need to know that serial killers aren't and identify by looking at them. So that that was the main focus of my book. Because, well, you know, you would think that that was self-evident because a serial killer wants to blend in with society, so they wouldn't do anything to necessarily stand out. In fact, they would probably go the opposite. I want to be attractive to my victims, to, to draw them in. I don't want to do a lot of work, so I want to draw them in. Well, that's, that's true with the organized serial killers, uh, the ones like Ted Bundy, uh, that who, who like to charm in lives and who are pretty, pretty adept at social, you know, socialization. But then you have the others on the, on the other side that are disorganized, according to the FBI, disorganized serial killers that do not socialize. They are loners. They're uh, below a rat IQ level. And they, they just select their, select their victims at random. Uh, kind of like Henry Lee Lucas, who yes. wrote, you know, he, him and Otis Toole, they kind of rode the rails and kind of just, eh, randomly, you know, killed people. Mm-hmm. And did he not lay claim to about over 200 victims? Yes, yes. But, of course, they didn't they were able to prove. Uh, but I don't remember maybe a handful of those, I think. I can't remember exactly how many they were actually able to verify. I think it's about eight eight or nine. Eight or nine, yeah. Yeah, and I I think that the the, the media kind of, um, in the way of movies and stuff, like people think that, um, you know, Silence of the Lambs, and, and, you know, people have this idea that serial killers are very sophisticated, smart, you know, um, in all cases, and that's that's just not true. No. Actually, serial killers, as far as their IQ goes, they follow the general population. Uh, you have uh, Otis Toole, whose who's IQ was like in the, I believe it's in the 70, 75 or so. Yes. And then you've got, of course, you've got Ted Kaczynski, who's the uh, Unabomber. His IQ was in the 140 range. So if they, they follow the general population. There, there's no uh, IQ that sets a serial killer apart. So in your book, Inside the Mind of a Serial Killer, um, what do you reveal? I mean, having said that, you know, we've we've got them over the span of the spectrum. Serial killers of all intellects, all types. What do they have? In, or what makes a person want to kill and be addicted to killing? Well, there was a broad... In, 19, excuse me, in 2005, the uh, FBI... Uh, sponsored a symposium in San Antonio, Texas, where they brought together 135 of the world's top, quote-unquote, serial killer experts. And their purpose was to come up with a one-size-fits-all template of a serial killer. And, of course, by their own admission, by the end of the 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 three days or five days, I can't remember, they realized that, you know, we failed. We can't do that. It's not possible. Yeah, this is Uh, a criminal mind. Yeah, they did, however, come up with a collection or a series of characteristics that are that are typical of a serial killer. But getting and just deciding that this is a that this one, one template fits all that they, they couldn't. It was not possible. But there, are, like I said, there are a collection of uh, characteristics uh, that deal with serial killers, and then more specifically the different types. And depending on what school of thought you use, 
whether it's canters or whether it's the FBI's, you know, you, you classify your serial killers. When you knew Jeffrey Dahmer, did you have any idea that he was uh, leaning toward being a killer or um, any indication that you thought he was off some sort? Not at all. No, not at all. He was, uh, he was very quiet. Uh, he, he, would, he would talk, but usually after you asked him a question, like Jeffrey Howard, but he, excuse me, his classes were in a different part of uh, Fort Sam Houston than ours, than ours were, but we were, in between us was the NCO club and the mess hall, so we would drink beer on Friday nights and, and eat our meals often together at the mess hall. But he was, uh, he was a very, and this sounds going weird, he was a very likable gentleman. Uh, oh, just very quiet. I, I believe you. Did he eat meat? <laughs> he was not a vegan, uh, apparently. <laughs> I, I just I just find that interesting that if you if you're you're sitting with someone and talking and you kind of get to know them a little you know a little I mean you're uh, obviously in school and doing things but um, it, did it really shock you when you found out about Dahmer later? Well, you know I hadn't really. In the military, you meet so many people. They come and go. You know, you, you make some friends and you forget about some you knew. And you, I had pretty much forgotten about it, actually. And my best friend one day he called me on the phone. He said, "Steve, he said, do you remember the guy that used to eat with us, sit across from us at the mess hall, and then we would have beer with at the NCO club?" I said, "Well, I don't know which guy you're talking about." He said, there were several. He said, "But the guy that used to almost always sit right across from us." had the aviator eyeglasses, sandy blonde hair. I said, yeah, I, I remember him. He said, do you know who that who that was? I said, I'm, thinking, I'm trying to think of his name. I thought, no, I can't. You know, it's been so long, no. He said, that was Jeffrey Dahmer. Of course, by that time, everybody knew who Jeffrey Dahmer was. And I said, are you sure? I said, well, that sounds vaguely familiar, but are you sure? He said, oh, I'm sure. So uh, I went back and looked at some papers. I thought, sure enough. It was Jeffrey Dahmer. And we didn't know at the time he had actually killed one person. The person he killed, I think it was his house, I believe. I can't remember. Uh, he had already killed one person. We had no clue. There was no evidence. There was nothing there to indicate that he was a serial killer, which is, you know, why one of the reasons I wrote the book is that you can't tell. But uh, yeah, we had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I would just think that's crazy. Um, and detecting liars, um, what are you giving people in that? That is a, a book of indicators that when you're talking to somebody or even texting somebody, things you can look for that uh, that may indicate that you're being lied to. You know, things mm -hmm. such as uh, pronoun changes, uh, just a variety of things, I shift, things that people can in a conversation that says, you know, while I can't be 100% certain because there's nothing, there's no technique, including polygraph, that's 100%, uh, you know, revealing on lies. But it gives you an idea that, hey, I, this person's probably not being truthful with me, and then you can take it from there on what you need to do. But, uh, yeah, there's a, about anchor points, uh, false, something we can, we can use called false incident questioning, illusion, a lot of things in the book that you can look for. Like, kind of like comfort gestures. Yeah, I mean, if a person, uh, if a person is, we had a, we had a case one time where they were this person was really good friends with this other person, but instead of calling her by name, she says she, her. Well, that's an indicator. If a person is using pronouns instead of a person's name, especially if they know the person real well. That indicates that they're trying to distance themselves from that person, that incident. Absolutely right. Now, do, do do people do that on purpose, consciously, or is that just something that happens subconsciously? It's usually autonomic. There are some things. People will. The big thing. The big thing is, well, if, if they won't look me in the eyes, they're lying to me. That is so. That is so totally not true. Because the common belief among people is that the person will not look me in the eyes, they're lying to me. Well, that's that's not true because you have people who have self-esteem issues yeah. uh, and different things that they, they they're not comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, they, they may not be lying to you, they're just not comfortable looking you in the eye when they're talking. 
Yeah, I find that uh, a lot of guys have a problem looking other guys directly in the eye. Yeah, there's PTSD, for instance. Uh, people who have uh, bipolar are not always comfortable looking somebody in the eye. So that, you know, if, if, if we use that as a guideline, then everybody that has self-esteem is using the liar, which is not true. True. It's so not true. You have to establish a baseline. Exactly. You, now, now you have to this, know what the normal conversation, how they act. You can look at somebody and say, well, they're lying to me, which is the baseline you talked about. Now, now, this is going to be an obvious answer, but just out of curiosity, I want to ask it. We've done a series of interviews lately about Jody Arias. Uh, are you familiar with her case? I am. I vaguely, I, know, I haven't studied or anything. Well, during her interviews... She assumed that the camera was off when the investigators left the room, and she proceeded to groom herself, do handstands against the wall. How much of that would you attribute to a person who is lying to you versus a person who is getting ready? Because, you know, again, I work corrections. I see this all the time. A person who is preparing themselves for an insanity defense. If she's in there and she's playing the victim and she's playing the poor old me part, and then all of a sudden they leave and they record her and she's doing all this other crap, obviously it's, it's an act, for, for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Now, well, heck, l let me take it a, 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 the next step, the next logical step. Lampley, l let's come home to Alabama. Um, let's, let's talk about Amy Bishop. During the staff meeting, she had the 9 millimeter hidden in her purse. She stood up during the staff meeting and shot eight people and killed five. And we had her in our jail for about three years. Wow. I mean, she was an extremely brilliant woman. Uh, brilliant, but you want to talk about egocentrical. I mean, the whole world revolved around her. Typical, yeah. But, I mean, what what uh, what teeters a person on that precipice that, that I'm an average person, now I'm going to kill multiple victims? What is that, I mean, what is that deciding factor? You didn't even know that Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial killer no. and, you know, uh, until you found out. What pushes that person from, I'm thinking about killing people, to I'm actually doing it? Well, see, Amy, Amy was a, a, a mass shooter. She was not a serial killer, so hers, hers was done all at once. And, uh, but she had killed her brother, according yeah. to Massachusetts police. You have to... You have to understand that there have been, there, there have, and you're probably not aware of this, but these, maybe the listeners are not, there have been multiple studies on the brains of serial killers, the childhood of serial killers, and while we don't know exactly what causes someone to be a mass murderer or a serial killer, there are indicators such as the, I think the prefrontal cortex is not as active in a serial killer as it is, or a, or a psychopath rather as it is in the average population. And you've got childhood experiences where they were almost always abused, had little or no supervision. Uh, you've got those indicators that are there for a majority of the serial killers. But Jeffrey Dahmer, for instance, had a relatively normal family life, but yet and he, he was loved and cared for, but yet he went on to kill people. So... As, as far as being able to say this set, like the FBI tried, this set of circumstances is going is what we're going to look for, and everybody in this in these for this set is going to be a serial killer. It's not possible. You can't do that. Uh, it's just like people thinking that serial killers are, are incredibly gen or incredibly smart, genius level, or they're crazy. Neither one of those is true. So what causes her? You know, it could be a brain. It could it could be a brain a problem. It could be a uh, childhood problem. It could be a stress. Who knows?
uh, what causes anyone you know, to, to, to do that. We just have these indicators that, that we have to go by uh, you know, and, try to, and try to maybe predict some of them, if at all right. possible, but that's not always possible. Now, on, on the Claremont killer, uh, you arrested the uh, Claremont killer. Um, what can you tell us about that case? He was in the uh, Navy in San Diego, California, followed several women home from the gym in, in the Claremont area, and he would wait. Of course, when you go to the gym, you go home, and the first thing you do is you get a shower. Well, he was he knew that. He would wait outside, give him a couple of minutes to get in the shower, jimmy the lock, go inside, their kitchen, in their kitchen, grab one of their knives and wait for him to get out of the shower. Uh, that happened six times. San Diego Police Department finally got a lead when he tried to do that on one girl, and he got caught, and he ran out. She got a description of him. Anyway, they were trying to get a, get a case on him, make a, make a solid case on him. When he got out of the Navy and flew or came back to Alabama where his mom lived in East Precinct area where I work, and uh, the night before of, the, of my arrest, he was in a bar on Southside in Birmingham at a bar on Valley Avenue, stole a carafe jar that had tips in it and got caught. He was arrested and taken to the Birmingham City Jail. At the same time, DNA evidence had come back from San Diego, and they now had a case on, on, the, on the Claremont killer. While he was bonding out of the Birmingham Jail, the warrants in California were being entered in the computer, and they missed each other. Uh, just oh. from my understanding, within an hour. Oh, wow. Changed. Wow. Yeah. So, so he got out of jail and went back to his uh, mom's house. Well, San Diego then saw where he had been arrested, flew two detectives to Birmingham, and uh, <laughs> as luck would have it, that was my last day on what we call utility status. Utility status for an officer is when you're out of the academy and you've done all your all your preparation and now you're a full-fledged officer, you're no longer a rookie, but you don't have enough seniority yet to be assigned to a regular car, so you work wherever they need you, off days or officer's vacation, wherever. Well, this was my last day on utility status, thank God. And the sergeant in his infinite wisdom, bless his heart, decided that I would work the desk that day. Gee, thank you, sergeant. Thanks, I was just what I wanted to do was work the desk. You know, no big deal. We'll work it one more time, get it over with. So I'm sitting at the desk when these two men in suits walk in, and they're from the San Diego Police Department. What they... What they were there was to meet our homicide detective, and they were going to take some cars to the uh, Cape City Housing Project where he where he was staying with his mom. And I was to call his mom, which is the number they got off the arrest report in the prior night, and ask for him. If he was there, they were going to kick the doors in and go arrest him on the on the six murder warrants they had. Well, no big deal, no problem. They get down there. I call the number. I use a non-recorded, non-traceable line to East Precinct. And I called his mom answers, and I asked for him. Well, she threw me completely off guard because little old Steve, new officer, hadn't prepped for this yet. She said, he's not here. That's not an option, ma'am. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Wait a minute. This is not an option. Uh, what do I do now? I've got a serial killer's mom, mom on the phone. What do I do? So I quickly told her. She said, well, who is this? I said, well, my name is Steve. I was a high school friend of his. And I heard he's back in town. I wanted to talk with him. She said, oh, he would like that. Anyway, long story short, he calls back. And, uh, of course, I had to tell him. I had to fess up. I said, look, I'm look, clear up. I'm, I'm not a friend of yours. I'm a police officer. You were arrested the night before. Uh, they did not, we have not finished all the paperwork on you. We've got more paperwork to do. I cannot come and get you. So if you will walk, if you'll come to East Precinct, we'll finish the paperwork. Because I'm sure you don't want us to send a patrol car to your house. That's not something you want. He said, Mom, don't, don't send a patrol car to my house. Don't, don't do that. I'll see if I can get a ride in. Well, about eight hours later, at 12, I think it was 12.15, he walks in the precinct. So uh, that's how that went down. <laughs> but he was, a, he, was a, he was a nice guy as well, a very outgoing, very likable kind of guy. <laughs>
Well, they used to. At least on the outside. <laughs> yeah, you see, just, you know, it's not socially acceptable to go out and kill people, but. Uh, yeah, he was other, as far as other, other than the killings, he was great. Oh, yeah, he's a, he's a nice guy, you know. <laughs> not somebody you want to go, go out with or anything, but he was a nice guy. Yeah. What do you think of the justice system as it is right now? Well, the, the justice system, to me, is, I mean, what else, what else, what other options do you have? We, we have the, you know, as far as the world's concerned, most people would say we have one of the best justice systems in the world. We do have a lot of faults. Uh, and I, I will be, and I know the, I know there's this stereotypical, this, uh, People say, or officers say, well, they got out of jail before I finished the paperwork. I've been there, done that. I've actually been at the Birmingham City Jail doing my paperwork, and then people walk out the door. Yeah, that's... Bonding out before I get back in my truck car. It, that is extremely discouraging. I understand that. Yeah. You know, uh, but, but it happens. Do you think the portrayal of... What cops actually do is pretty accurate on TV. It depends on what you show, what show you watch. I, was, I had this conversation with somebody last week. They said, "Well, you know, have you seen so and so?" Well, as a rule, I'll just be honest. I don't watch cop shows. Uh, I don't particularly like them. Yeah. But there, there was a cop. Cops is. Is sort of real, but I have sat and watched. Of course, cops is no longer on television, but I have sat and watched it and just shook my head. So that's not how, you know, the camera's talking. There's cameras talking. Uh, the, the, the cops are this particular this particular officer talking to the camera. Uh, not all of them. Some of them were some of them were real, but there was one uh, there was one television show on TV. It was a it was a series. And to me, it represented police officers in a in a more realistic fashion than any other program I have ever seen, including cops. And I believe it was called Southland or South. Yes, I Southland. It. Southland. Southland. Yes, it sir. Was, uh, it was to me that was the best television show for police officers I've ever seen. But it didn't last long. I don't think. I think it may be a probably. season or three. I'm not sure. Probably yeah, too. probably because it was too realistic and not glorious enough. Yeah. 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 But to me, that was the most realistic uh, television show for police officers that I had seen. And, and, and what do you think about um, the, the current status of police and, uh, and, and, and all the, you know, controversies going on with um, people being shot and, and uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, ne negative talk and stuff like that. And, how does how does that make you feel, and and what's your opinion of of, of how cops do their job? Well, most statistically speaking, less than one half of one percent of any of officers are doing something that that, in the words of Paul Harvey, misfit their badge. Ninety nine plus percent of all. Are, are doing what they need to be doing, following the letter of the law, and they're, they're doing things properly. Unfortunately, you've got you've got those few that, and I'll say it, think they're above their badge, above the law, and get into situations that they that they should know are wrong, doing things they know or should be wrong, and that can't, that's what makes the news. You mm -hmm. don't ever see on the news, or very rarely ever see on the news, that this police officer did this or did that to help somebody or did this. But what the news wants to show is what people want. I don't want to say want to see, but that, that's what makes the news. News is mostly negative. And am I, are all police officers above, you know, are, are they all great? No. But they're not all accountants and all doctors and all priests. And they're, they're, there's no 100% in any profession. It's just that police are in the limelight, uh, and I'm not I'm not making excuses for them because there are bad ones out there. There's bad ones in any profession, but it does it hurts the whole profession in, in general when somebody goes off on a limb like that. True, and let me amend that statement. Um, I remember in one year at, at our jail, 
we had three officers perform heroic acts. Two of them saved inmates from suicide. Another one, and I, I will testify to this one because I was involved, we performed CPR on an inmate that had a heart attack and actually saved his life. Mm -hmm. None of that made the news. No. But one officer struck an inmate who was in restraints, and that made the news, and it made a federal lawsuit. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly the case. You know, the, the, there was, and I hate to keep telling war stories, but a case in point, it's in my book, Outside Your Door. Uh, we had a magistrate in the city of Birmingham who had severe animosity toward police officers. And that's that's something you really don't need if you, you've got a magistrate that has animosity toward police officers. That's a hard situation because you work so close. Uh, well, that, the senior magistrate decided he would send this uh, junior magistrate out on the street with a police officer and let them see what let him see what we do. Well, for some reason, they didn't need to ride him around. And it wasn't too long into the shift that the adjoining beat car, this was in the city of Birmingham, the adjoining beat car got a call on a suicidal person in a shed in the backyard. I thought, well, here's a good chance. So we, we went to back up the officer. When we got there, the sergeant had already arrived along with the other beat car, and the sergeant come out from behind his patrol car. What it was was an elderly man, sitting in the backyard in one of those metal sheds, the door open, sitting on a five-gallon bucket, shotgun butt sitting on the floor, barrel under his chin, finger on the trigger. Oh, boy. Just waiting just waiting to blow his head off. At any, at any given, just pull the trigger, it's done. Well, the sergeant comes out from behind his patrol car in plain view, looking in the shed, no protection whatsoever, and looks at the gentleman and raises his hands. He said, sir, I want to talk to you. I don't want any, I don't want you to shoot me and I don't want you to shoot yourself. He said, what I'm about to do, I want you to know, he said, I'm going to take my right hand and I'll reach down and I'm going to pull the, my keeper off, what keeps my belt on. Mm -hmm. I want you to watch me. Yes. He's right in front of him. He said, I'm going to take my left hand. Anyway, he lowered his belt, his gun belt to the ground. He said, now sir, I'm going to keep my hands raised. I don't have a weapon. I want to come to the shed. Will you let me come to the door and talk to you? And the gentleman said, Still sitting with a shotgun. So the sergeant goes up to the door, and of course we can't hear the conversation because we're behind our cars. He talks to the gentleman, and then like five minutes or so, he goes in the shed. So the magistrate who was riding with me said some lessons. He said, he was in the shed. I said, yeah, he did. He said, why did he do that? I just looked at him and looked back toward the shed. It was, uh, I don't remember the span of time, maybe 20 minutes later, the sergeant comes out of the shed with the elderly man, and the sergeant has a shotgun in his hand. Of course, they took yes. the elderly man to the hospital for a psych eval. And uh, we're riding down the street, and I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth shut. Finally, the magistrate looked over at me and says, that has to be the single greatest act of bravery I've ever seen in my life. I said, well, you asked why he did that, and I didn't answer you. I said, the reason he did that is because he cares. We all care. Exactly. You know, and that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't make the news. No, but, but that is beautiful. We perform acts, if I can brag on my, my team, and, you know, you and I talk as law enforcement officers for just a moment. Members of my team do that every day in the jail. Mm -hmm. We approach these inmates as people, as human beings, and and talk them away from doing even worse acts behind those walls. And it never it never makes the news. Just whenever we screw up, makes the news and. It, it is a terrible feeling that we do so much good, but the media just portrays us as a bunch of knuckle-dragging hats. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, like like your sergeant. You know, he went in there and he approached that 
man who was in distress as a human, as a person, and, and talked him away from committing, you know, the, the ultimate of murder, killing himself. Mm-hmm. And that magistrate didn't understand it because they're kind of on the fringes of law enforcement. But we do those acts every day. We walk into those dorms every day. Um, I had an individual just a couple of days ago show me a shank. And he's like, you're going to have to come in here and get it from me, Thompson. And, and I had to approach him as a person. No, I'm not. You're going to put it right there on that food port. Well, no, you're going to have to come in and tase me and spray me and get this from me. Uh, come on. And I, and I said his name because we're familiar with each other. And I've developed a rapport. I'm like, no, you know me better than that. I'm not going to come in there. You put it there on the food port, and I'll talk to you like a man. And I will treat you with dignity and respect like a man. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And he put it on the food port. What did I do? I kept my word. You didn't shoot. And I kept... What's that? What's that, Al? You didn't No, I I, I didn't. (laughs) You know, although I would have, at that point, with him with a weapon, I would have been justified. But I, I talked to him like a man, through, through the food port, mind you. I'm not a fool, but he gave up the weapon, and we treated him like a man. Exactly. Yeah, if you, if you treat people, with them, there's a story in my book about, and I guess I keep referring to my book, there's a story in my book outside the door about, about that as well. If you treat, oh, people, people get involved in things in their life, and they make mistakes. They make stupid mistakes sometimes, but that doesn't make them a bad person. They just mean they made a mistake. You know, you treat them with respect, and as a human being, you'll you'll get a whole lot farther uh, than you would, you know, dogging them out or, or treating them like some kind of animal. Exactly, uh, especially in jail. You know, if if I can kind of, you know, expound on this, because they're behind bars and they feel like animals. Mm-hmm. So if you treat them like a person, you, you're kind of elevating them outside of those bars, if not at least for a moment, you know? That's true. You're exactly right. But so, the, the things you talk about, you know, the, the good things that go on in the jail that, uh, that y'all do on a daily basis, you, you're not going to see that on the news because that's not what, that's not what the news media wants to, people wants to show. So, Steve, let's talk about uh, you, your books. Now, your books can be found, of course, at Amazon. And um, do you, uh, now let's, let's give out your website. Uh, so people, if they want to get sure. in contact with you or if they want to uh, find out more about you and your books, um, where do they go? Sure, it's, uh, it's my name at dot com. Stephen with a V is in Victor. Stephen David Lampley at dot, uh, dot com. Well, perfect, and uh, excellent books and uh, excellent character. We've we've really enjoyed talking with you today, and uh, and and hope to have you back. Well, I'm glad. Any time, let me know. Uh, be happy to be a guest. Um, I enjoyed it. Appreciate your opp- the opportunity to be here with you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.